Welcome back to part two of You Mean I Don't Have to Tithe? A Deconstruction of Tithing and a Reconstruction of New Covenant. Last week we discussed several things. We discussed several definitions that are important for our study. We discussed what the word tithe means, that the word tithe means one-tenth or ten percent. We discussed what the Old Testament tithe was, and we gave a general definition of the word giving. We also covered 2,000 years of church history in about five minutes, and then we discussed Abraham and Jacob's tithe in the Old Testament. In order to motivate you to understand how important this topic is, headline story on May 5, 2009, African women prostitute themselves to afford tithes. An excerpt from the article reads, People are now paying for prayers, paying for praising and worshiping their Heavenly Father. No wonder ladies are going into fornication and or prostitution in order to pay their tithes and offerings, some of which are up to eight, if not more, alongside forceful vows and other levies. Women are actually prostituting themselves to afford to pay tithes. This is truly a serious issue that we need to have a biblical grasp on to avoid such atrocities as this. Again, let me define for you tithing in the Old Testament. The act of giving one out of every ten items produced from the ground, that is, crops, grain from the soil, or fruit from the trees, or from the herd. It only applied when the Israelites lived in Palestine and never referred to earned income. Now, I've given you that definition last time, and now I've given it to you again this time. As we go through tithing in the Mosaic Law, hopefully you'll see that that is the correct definition of tithing in the Old Testament. Our structure for today is pretty simple. One, we'll talk about tithing in the Mosaic Law. We'll talk about tithing in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And two, we'll talk about tithing in Malachi chapter 3. What we're going to attempt to do as we go through the passages in the Mosaic Law is to decipher the precise description of the tithes prescribed to the Israelites in the Mosaic Law. Now, there are three major, major passages related to tithing in the Mosaic Law. Leviticus 27, Numbers 18, and Deuteronomy 14. So we're going to talk through these passages and see what is the description of the tithe in these passages. So each passage will be examined to understand the requirement placed upon the Israelites. Now, the primary key to identifying how many separate tithes may have existed within the Mosaic Law is the details of their description. So we have to be very careful and very specific in describing each of these tithes. Now, as we look at Leviticus 27, verses 30 to 33, we have to understand who Levites are and who the priests are. Levi was of the tribe and the Levites were members of the tribe of Levi. Priests were descendants of Aaron, who was of the tribe of Levi. Aaron was in the tribe of Levi, and the priests served periodically, not full-time, at the temple or at the tabernacle. So there's a difference between priests and Levites. The priests are a smaller, more select group within the Levites. So Leviticus 27 is a general introduction to the topic of tithing. Now, Leviticus, Leviticus 27, the chapter in general, is about vows, but a change takes place at verse 26 away from what can be vowed to what is not liable to vows. And it gives three things that are not liable to vows. The firstlings of animals, any devoted thing, and the tithe of the land. In other words, this is key, tithes in the Mosaic Law, are totally and completely distinct from vows. Now, let's read our passage. Thus, all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If, therefore, a man wishes to redeem part of his tithe, he shall add to it one-fifth of it. For every tenth part of herd or flock, whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He is not to be concerned whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. Or if he does exchange it, then both it and its substitute shall become holy. 
it shall not be redeemed. So let's talk about this passage a little bit. What is liable to tithes according to Leviticus 27? Three categories. One, the seed of the land. Number two, the fruit of the tree. And number three, every tenth animal of the herd or flock. And all three categories are connected to the land. Now, interestingly, this third one, the way it's described in Leviticus 27, it's the tenth animal that passes under the rod. So if you had nine animals pass under the rod, you didn't pay a tithe at all on your animals. And if you had ten animals, you'd pay, you'd give one, you'd give a tenth. If you had 19 animals, again, you'd only give one. One out of 19 is not a tenth. So in this third category, the animal tithe, it didn't actually work out to be 10% all the time. Now notice that in all three of these categories, we have seed, fruit, and animal, but money is not mentioned as being liable to tithes. But money is mentioned in Leviticus. It's just not mentioned as being liable to tithes. A common objection I hear at this point is, but they were an agricultural society. They didn't deal in money. Let's, let's deal with that objection in a little bit of detail now. Here are verses, starting in Genesis 17, that deal with money. Genesis 17, bought with money, bought with your money, bought with his money, bought with money, consumed our purchase price, 400 pieces of money, to restore every man's money in his sack. He saw his money. My money has been returned. Every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they had, when they and their father saw their bundles of money, take double the money in your hand and take back in your hand the money. Genesis 43, they took double the money in their hand. And it continues through Genesis 43 and 44 and 47. And you can see there are plenty of references to money. Now, I'm not denying that this was an agricultural society. All I'm saying is that money wasn't non-existent. They did deal with money. They would pay for things with money. Things were bought with money. So money was a part of this society. In the end, 29 times a reference is made to money in Genesis. Now, usually, it's the word kesef, the Hebrew word kesef, which means silver, literally, or money. Now, they didn't have coins, per se, back then, but they did have silver that could be used the way that we would use money. So before tithing is mentioned in the Mosaic Law, money has been referred to about 38 times. Now, notice the last reference before tithing is actually mentioned. That comes from Leviticus 25, verse 37, which reads, You shall not lend him your money at interest, nor give him your food for profit. Now, why is that significant? Because Leviticus 25, verse 37, contains ancient banking system rules. It's talking about money, and it's talking about interest on money and lending. So they had a system of money. Money wasn't as rare as we've been led to believe. Originally, a shekel was not a unit of coinage, but rather a measure of weight. In fact, shekel is actually a Hebrew word for weight. Now, the minting of coins was not begun until the late 7th century BC. That's much after the time of Moses and Abraham and Jacob. So, when it talks about money in Genesis, it's not talking about coins, but it's talking about silver. And the weight of the silver, depending on how much it weighed, would tell you how much it was worth. Now, archaeological evidence indicates that a shekel worth of silver from limestone weights was around 11.4 grams. So we do know a lot of data about shekel, shekels and money and silver from the time uh, in, in the Old Testament. In fact, here's a picture of a shekel of Simeon from the time period of the Second Jewish Revolt against Rome. Here are some more coins dating back to the time from before the New Testament was written. So, what about the objection? But they were an agricultural society? They didn't deal in money? Well, yes, they were an agricultural society, but they did deal in money. They did have money. And sometimes you would pay for things in money. And so when someone earned income, and the income was money, the Mosaic Law never says that that money is liable to tithes. And there was plenty of times where Moses could have said that, where God could have put a command in there to say, and if you've earned income from anything, 
10% of it comes to me. He never says that. So back in Leviticus 27, the question is, who receives these tithes? Well, the puzzling thing about Leviticus 27, and one of the reasons I believe that it's just a general introduction, is that it doesn't say. It just says that the tithes belong to Yahweh. It's kind of giving a, a theological foundation for what tithing is in the Mosaic Law. Remember, they were tithing was practiced by the surrounding cultures, and so when it's going to be incorporated into the Mosaic Law, some theological grounding needs to be given to it so that Israelites can understand how tithing in the Mosaic Law is different from tithing in the surrounding cultures. Now, Leviticus 27 is not directly compatible with number 18, Numbers 18 nor Deuteronomy 14, as we'll see. But it's a general introduction to tithing in the Mosaic Law, and it fits perfectly into the scheme of tithing in the Mosaic Law as a whole. The tithe of animals is not mentioned in Numbers 18 nor in Deuteronomy 14. So this animal or cattle tithe is very difficult. But in connection with 2 Chronicles 31.5, it appears to be another tithe from the Israelites to the priests. But we can't be too certain of that. So Leviticus 27 is a general introduction which includes a description of what is to be tithe and then it defines for us the cattle or animal tithe. Then Numbers 18, verses 20 through 24, that we'll read in a minute, is a description of the Levitical tithe. The following verses, verses 25 to 30, describe the priestly tithe. Deuteronomy 14, verses 22 to 20, 27, describe the festival or the feast tithe. And finally, in Deuteronomy 14, 28 and 29, we have a reference to what I like to call the charity tithe. Some will call it the welfare tithe or the poor tithe, but I prefer the charity tithe. So here, in these passages, we have a reference to the cattle tithe, Levitical tithe, priestly tithe, festival tithe, and charity tithe. That's a total of five distinct tithes. Now, if you're confused now, when we start going through the details, I'm not sure if it's going to get any clearer or any more confusing. Hopefully, I'll be able to guide you through and you can see how these tithes all work together. Now, I'm not even discussing some of the other tithes that are mentioned in the Old Testament that can really confuse this that are totally unrelated to all of these. I'm not going to get into those. For example, there's one in Amos that I'm not going to talk about. But these are the main tithes we need to talk about to accomplish our tasks uh, for this week. So let's le read about the Levitical tithe in Numbers 18, verses 20 through 24. Then the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land, nor own any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the sons of Israel. To the sons of Levi, behold, I have given all the tithe in Israel for an inheritance, in return for their service in which they perform, the service of the tent of meeting. The sons of Israel shall not come near the tent of meeting again, or they will bear sin and die. Only the Levites shall perform the service of the tent of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations, and among the sons of Israel they shall have no inheritance. For the tithe of the sons of Israel, which they offer as an offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore I have said concerning them, they shall have no inheritance among the sons of Israel. Now in the Mosaic Law, the Levites stood between Israel and God offering daily sacrifices for sin. Numbers 18, 20 through 24 declares that the Levites will receive the entire tithe for their services of bearing this burden and for not getting an inheritance of land. Now this is an important aspect of the tithe as it relates to the Levites and priests. They did not receive it as a wage, but as an inheritance. They didn't receive land as inheritance. They received the tithe as their inheritance. Now, this offering was compulsory, and it was used for the livelihood of the Levites. It's mainly how the Levites were to survive. They were given some land for farming, but not very much land. So this was the main way that the Levites were to survive. The following verses, Numbers 18, 25 through 30, discuss the priestly tithe. But 1831 turns back to the Levites and instructs them that they may eat the tithes anywhere. So three questions. Who receives this tithe in Numbers 18, 20 to 24? The answer, the Levites receive the tithe. Now why do they get the tithe? They get it 
for bearing the burden and not getting an inheritance of land. Instead of inheritance, they get the tithe. Now, where is it eaten? It is eaten anywhere. These things may not seem important right now, but they'll become very important in a few minutes. Let's now turn our attention to the priestly tithe, which is in the following verses, Numbers 18, 25 through 28, which reads, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Moreover, you shall speak to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the sons of Israel the tithe which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall present an offering from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. Your offering shall be reckoned to you as the grain from the threshing floor or the full produce from the wine vat. So you shall also present an offering to the Lord from your tithes, which you receive from the sons of Israel, and from it you shall give the Lord's offering to Aaron the priest. This priestly tithe is what I call a sub-tithe. The Levites were to receive the tithes from the Israelites and then give tithes from that to the priests. So there were two instructions for the priestly tithe. Number one, the amount was prescribed as one-tenth of all they received as gifts. Number two, the quality of the offering was to be the best of what they had received. So the amount was prescribed, prescribed and the quality of the offering was prescribed. So now we've discussed the Levitical tithe and the priestly tithe. Now we're going to turn our attention to the festival tithe. Now Deuteronomy 12 verses 17 to 19 introduces the second tithe, which is more fully explained in 14, 22 to 27. But let's start off and just read Deuteronomy 12. You are not allowed to eat within your gates the tithe of your grain or new wine or oil or the firstborn of your herd or flock or any of your votive offerings which you vow or your free will offerings or the contribution of your hand. But you shall eat them before the Lord your God in the place which the Lord your God will choose, you and your son and daughter and your male and female servants and the Levite who is within your gates. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in all your undertakings. Be careful that you do not forsake the Levite as long as you live in your land. So the description of the festival tithe in Deuteronomy 12 is actually quite different. First of all, you can't eat within your own gate. You can't eat anywhere. Two, you have to eat it in the place God chooses, which eventually became Jerusalem. So a specific location is given for the eating of the festival tithe, and that is Jerusalem. And three, we're given this warning not to forget the Levite. And that's very important, not to forget the Levite. Now Deuteronomy 14 verses 20 through, to, through 27 are also describing the festival tithe. And it reads, You shall surely tithe all the produce from what you sow, which comes out of the field every year. You shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to establish his name the tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock, so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. If the distance is so great for you that you are not able to bring the tithe, since the place where the Lord your God chooses to set his name is too far away from you when the Lord your God blesses you, then you shall exchange it for money and bind the money in your hand and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses. You may spend the money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen, or sheep, or wine, or strong drink, or whatever your heart desires. And there you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. Also, you shall not neglect the Levite who is in your town, for he has no portion or inheritance among you. So let's do a comparison of the Levitical tithe and the festival tithe. The Levitical tithe you could eat anywhere, and it was for the Levites. The festival tithe you had to eat in Jerusalem and it was for all of Israel, including the Levites. The Levitical tithe, the owner was the Levites. But with the festival tithe, the owner was the original owner. He had control over it. In the Levitical tithe, the purpose was to replace land inheritance. Since the Levites didn't get an inheritance of land, instead they got the tithe. That was the purpose for it. The festival tithe, the purpose was to teach the fear of the Lord. Because the Jews were supposed to go to Jerusalem and celebrate there in a festival. And that was going to teach them about the fear of the Lord. 
With a Levitical tithe, you would add 20% if you wanted to redeem something you were going to bring. The festival tithe, there's no mention of a 20% addition for redemption. Now, the main objection to what I've just said is the following. Some will say it is unlikely that the festival tithe would have been instituted without introduction or clarification. In other words, when Moses wrote Deuteronomy, he wouldn't have introduced something else, another law about tithing, without clarifying something about the first law, or introducing it, or reminding them about the first law. Since he never references anything about the Numbers 18 Levitical tithe, or priestly tithe, then this must be talking about the same thing. Well, here's my response to that. In both Deuteronomy 12 and Deuteronomy 14, the Israelites are exhorted not to neglect the Levites. See, these verses are a reference to the Levitical tithe, since that is the tithe that provided for the Levites and guaranteed they would not be neglected. Therefore, these verses, Deuteronomy 12.19 and 14.27, contain references to the Levitical tithe, a clarification to the Israelites that even though another tithe, that is the festival tithe, is being instituted, they are still responsible for the Levitical tithe. Now, if you're not already confused, let me add another tithe onto this, the charity tithe, which is in the following two following verses after the festival tithe in Deuteronomy 14, 28, and 29. This describes a third separate tithe, and it can be distinguished from the previous two because, number one, it was offered every third year, and number two, it was intended for the Levite, foreigner, orphan, and widow. Furthermore, in the Hebrew, Deuteronomy 14.27 marks the end of a paragraph, thus separating verses 27 and 28. So with the previous tithes, they were given every year for the Levitical tithe, or during the feast for the festival tithe. With the charity tithe, it's given every third year. Now this can be separated from the Levitical tithe because the Levitical tithe was mostly for the Levites' sustenance. The charity tithe was not for the Levites only. It was also for foreigners, orphans, and widows. Now is this really a separate tithe? It's kind of hard to believe that there would be this many tithes instructed in the Mosaic Law. Well, I ask this. If the charity tithe replaced the Levitical tithe every third year, as some have suggested, then how were the Levites sustained that year? How were they going to be able to survive that year when the tithe that was given to them, instead of land, is now taken away and is divided among the widows, the orphans, the poor, and the Levites? Also, if the charity tithe replaced the festival tithe every third year, did the Israelites just ignore the prescribed feasts in those years? Surely they didn't just ignore those feasts, so they still had to celebrate them. And what did they celebrate them with? The festival tithe. Such theories create more problems than they solve. Now finally, the mention of the year of tithing in Deuteronomy 16.12 probably corroborates this conclusion that the year of tithing was the year that they would actually have to give three tithes and be giving about 30% on, in tithes. Which raises another issue. How do we calculate the percentage given by the Israelites? Well, essentially it's impossible. They gave an average probably of 20% yearly from the produce of the land, but that doesn't tell us how much they gave overall. Differences exist among those who have calculated the percentages. Uh, some who think that all the tithes were describing the same exact thing would say 10%, but that's very few. Some would say that they gave 20%. Some would say 23 and a third, based on the idea that they would give 20, 20, 30, 20, 20, 30. Some would say around 25%. Others say 33, and others say 50%. Regardless of the total, what should be clear is that the tithe laws are more complicated than a mere 10%, and the Israelites were required to give in excess of 10% from the land. Furthermore, no mention is made of tithing from income. Nowhere does any of these pass do any of these passages describe tithing from income. It's always connected to the land. Second, historically speaking, Judaism around the time of Christ understood the Old Testament as prescribing multiple tithes. In Tobit, an intertestamental book, 
written after Malachi and before the time of Christ. Tobit chapter 1 mentions three distinct tithes. Josephus, a Jewish historian writing at the end of the first century, he references three tithes in years 3 and 6 of the seven-year cycle. So he holds to three distinct tithes. The Mishnah, which was a, a collection of rabbinic thought put together into a, a book form between the year 200 and 250 A.D. after the writing of the New Testament, the Mishnah describes the three tithes, but they say that there was never more than two in one year. Therefore, the Mishnah differs from both Tobit and Josephus. However, all three sources hold to multiple tithes. Now, the view taken here is that there are three basic tithes, but a total of five. They are all distinct from one another. The Levitical, the festival, the charity, the animal or cattle tithe, and the priestly tithe, which was a sub-tithe of the Levitical tithe. Now, some may dispute whether Judaism around the time of Christ was correct in its understanding of the Old Testament prescriptions regarding tithing, but it should be noted that this understanding is never challenged in the New Testament. If the New Testament writers considered tithing as consistent with the New Covenant era, then their understanding most likely would have been that of two, if not three, distinct tithes. And there is no document that has been located that suggests that first century Judaism held to a single tithe. Number three, tithes were given from the increase of the land. The Mosaic law never directed the Israelites to give of their increase. It specified particular products that were liable to tithe laws. And it was only those products that they had to tithe on. Now what is this reference to the land? Well, it's not very ambiguous, it's actually very clear. The connection of products liable to tithes to the land was very strong. Originally, only products produced from Israel were included. In the New Testament period, artisans, fishermen, and tradesmen did not pay tithes on their income. And Jews outside of Israel, those in the diaspora, those who had spread out, did not pay tithes on anything. So, artisans, fishermen, some of the disciples were that, tradesmen, like oh, a carpenter, for example, did not have to pay tithes on their income. Jews outside of Israel did not pay tithes on anything because they weren't connected to the land. Furthermore, priests and the poor, poor who own no land or animals, were exempt from tithes. We would never hear that priests have to pay tithes. And, we, and if you were poor and you didn't own land and you didn't have animals, you also didn't have to pay tithes. You weren't expected to. That's clear in the first century. Fourth and finally, was the tithe in the Mosaic Law a tax? Well, a tax is a required contribution for the support of, the, of government. A religious contribution is a voluntary offering to support religion. What's the tithe in the Mosaic Law? Well, really it contains aspects of both. It is, it's a tax in the sense that, well, it was used to support the government because they had a theocracy. So, while it's supporting the government, it's also supporting the religion. So we can't really distinguish whether the tithe was a tax purely or a religious offering purely. It was really both. Let's do a comparison on the pre-Mosaic Law tithe compared to the Mosaic Law tithe. First, we'll do Abraham versus Mosaic Law tithing. Abraham's tithe was connected to a vow. In the Mosaic Laws, tithes are not subject to vows. Abraham, we see him tithe once. We don't know if he ever did it again. Mosaic Law, it's supposed to be systematic. Abraham tied to Melchizedek, who we find out is a priest. In the Mosaic Law, it's partially for the Levites, also somewhat for the priests, when the Levites would give their tithes. Abraham's tithe was voluntary. The Mosaic Law was compulsory. Abraham did not tithe from his possessions or from the increase in his possessions. The Mosaic Law, you tithed on the increase from the land. Abraham was giving from the spoils of war. Mosaic Law, 
increase from the land. Abraham gave 10%. The Mosaic Law averages about 20%. Now let's look at Jacob versus Mosaic Law tithing. Jacob, again, his tithe is connected to a vow. And it's fascinating that the Mosaic Law explicitly says tithing and vows do not go together. And that's the only other two references before the Mosaic Law connect them, and the Mosaic Law is distinguishing between tithing and vows. So Jacob gave, maybe he gave his tithe after that 20-year period, so it was an occasional offering. Well, the Mosaic Law, it was a systematic offering. Now Jacob, did he give off the general increase? He, it seems like he did on a one-time deal. We're not really sure. The Mosaic Law specific products were liable to tithes not just a general increase. Now let's turn our attention to Malachi chapter 3. What is the purpose of Malachi chapter 3? The main purpose of this section of Malachi is a call to repentance and a reminder of God's faithfulness, which Malachi illustrates with the specific issue of tithes and offerings. So in spite of people's sins, God loved them and patiently waited for them to return. That's the main point of Malachi chapter 3. Read with me Malachi 3, 6 through 12. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, How shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you? in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Let's deal with some questions. Question 1. What do offerings refer to? One fact that may explain why this passage is frequently misapplied is that not many interpretations of this text deal with the question of how to define the term offerings. Verhoeven comments that the offering was not taken from the cereal offering or from the sin offerings, these being most sacred, but from the peace offerings and other sacred gifts in the form of the breast of the wave offering, the thigh of the ram of ordination, referencing Exodus 29, the cakes of leavened bread, etc., in Leviticus 7. It was one of the chief sources of the priest's livelihood. So like tithes, these were compulsory contributions required by the Mosaic Law for the temple staff. How are offerings defined today? Well, let's see, I made $93. That would be a tithe of $9.30. Well, I'll just round it up to $10. So I have a $9.30 tithe and a $0.70 cent offering. We round up. Maybe we'll make it $11. We'll be generous that week. But we round up our tithe and we call that an offering. But an offering in the Old Covenant had a very specific referent. And it was these things that Verhoeven is talking about that is the referent of offering. It's not just a little extra money on top of your tithe. In other words, offerings do not refer to tipping God or rounding up your tithe. Question two, what does the storehouse refer to? The phrase storehouse tithing has become popular in the last century. But the word storehouse does not refer to local churches. It was an actual building used by the Levites to store all they received, like grains and livestock. The Levites would either use or sell these items as they saw need. This storehouse is referenced in 2 Chronicles 31 verses 10 to 12 and is not part of the Mosaic Law, but was added on for storage purposes. Basically, the storehouse was a barn. Let's take a look at Second Chronicles 31. Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, said to him, Since the contributions began to be brought into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat with, plenty left over. 
for the Lord has blessed his people, and this great quantity is left over. Then Hezekiah commanded them to prepare rooms in the house of the Lord, and they prepared them. They faithfully brought in the contributions and the tithes and the consecrated things, and Konaniah the Levite was the officer in charge of them, and his brother Shemai was second. The tithes were being brought in in such great quantities that some were being spoiled. So they built a storehouse to put them into so they wouldn't spoil. It was a barn. That's where they would store the grains and the fruit and the animals that were brought in. That's what the storehouse refers to, not local churches. Question three, is this testing universal? Now, it's unusual, but not unheard of, but it's unusual in the Old Testament for a man to test God. In fact, there is great danger in testing God when our hearts are not right. See Malachi 3.15. Or, testing God on one's own initiative. However, Malachi does not state this testing in universal terms, but in fact limits it to the current situation by the phrase, test me now in this, in the middle of, of chapter 3, verse 10. The expression, in this, most likely refers to the current situation. Not many uh, pastors, preachers, or commentaries note this. But one commentator noted that the phrase, in this, limits this testing not to universal, but to the specific situation that the Jews were in at the time. Question 4. What is the promised reward? Well, the promised reward is threefold. One, the windows of heaven will be opened. Two, God will prevent the devourer. And number three, the vines will not cast their fruit. What does this phrase mean? The windows of heaven will be opened. Is one author right who wrote in his book that this means that God will open up the window of heaven and $20 bills will fly into your pocket? No, the windows of heaven being opened is a promise of rain. The combination of Aruba and Shemaim as a phrase occurs in Genesis 7, Genesis 8, 2 Kings 7, and Malachi 3. This phrase, every time, refers to rain and nothing else. This is an appropriate promise to make in Malachi 3, since the context is an agricultural society. However, rain was the promise and nothing else is an agricultural society that did have money. If he wanted to promise them money, he could have sent them money. He could have said, uh, the windows of heaven will be opened up, and I will provide for you silver from the sky. But he doesn't say that. He says, just the windows of heaven will be opened. Only a reference to rain. Notice in Genesis chapter 7, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were opened. The floodgates of the sky, that's the exact Hebrew phrase there, Genesis 8. Uh, same context here. Also, the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed, and the rain from the sky was restrained. There's no reference to money flying into pockets. It's a reference to rain. Now, if you read 2 Kings 7, and uh, verse 2 and verse 7, 19, you'll see also there references to rain. You can also compare that to Isaiah 24, 18, which is a similar phrase. So the windows of heaven will be opened is a reference only to rain. Number two, God will prevent the devourer. The second promise will keep locusts from destroying people's crops. This is an agricultural society. He's telling them he's going to stop the locusts from destroying their crops. That's what that means. Nothing else. It doesn't mean, as some have said, if you refuse to pay your tithe, don't worry, God's going to get it from you anyways. God will take his 10%. He'll get it one way or another. He'll send the devourer after you. No, it means locusts eating crops. So number one, rain. Number two, he'll stop the locusts. Number three, the vines will not cast their fruit. This is a promise of, an abund of abundant crops. An agricultural society. That's why it's test me in this, you people, at this time period. See, Malachi 3, I believe, was written in a very specific uh, window. When Nehemiah came and 
helped in the rebuilding of the walls around Jerusalem. He left for a period, it says in Nehemiah. And I believe, along with Old Testament scholar Walt Kaiser, that Malachi 3 takes place when Nehemiah left Jerusalem. And he had reinstituted a lot of these things, but they started failing again in them. And they started failing in the paying of their tithes. And that's what this is referring to, to these people in this situation. It's not a universal thing. It's a very specific thing. So rain, stopping locusts, and abundant crops. None of that has anything to do with money. Let me give you two quotes about the promised reward. A scholar named Alden observes that since he was dealing with an agrarian society, the blessings had to do with crops and the like. Furthermore, Smith's corrective should be noted as well. It may be that this passage in Malachi should be understood as a one-time special act on God's part to renew the fires of faith in an age of skepticism and indifference. If so, then this is not an open-ended promise to bless in a material way anyone and everyone who tithes his possessions. And question 5. Are Christians robbing God if they fail to tithe? For this one, I'll note the conclusion in the Liberty Bible Commentary, a commentary edited by the late Jerry Falwell. On Malachi chapter 3, written by Paul Fink, it says, Each believer is independently accountable to God for the allotment of the money God entrusts to him. The principle holds true today. God blesses his children not because they give 10% or more, but because in their cheerful giving, keeping with the measure that God has blessed, they are giving testimony of their obedience, subjection to, and dependence upon God. Well said by Paul Fink there. So we see that the description of tithing in the Mosaic Law is fairly complicated. And we see that Malachi chapter 3 really doesn't have an explicit command for Christians that applies to Christians to tithe, but it was specifically for the Jews in the Old Covenant to tithe. But there are possible parallels to tithing and whether or not it would apply to today. And as I read through all the tithe literature, they would draw parallels between adultery and say, well, just like adultery was against was, was sin in the Old Testament and it's sin in the New Testament, same with tithing. But I don't think adultery is a good example. Murder is another one. They'll say, well, murder was bad in the Old Covenant and murder is bad in the New, just like tithing. I don't think that's a good example either. Another one that's been raised is circumcision. And circumcision seems like it's a pretty good parallel. The problem with that is circumcision in the, in the New Testament is explicitly abrogated. Tithing is not, so it's not a very fair comparison. The Sabbath, well, the Sabbath has a lot of issues dealing with um, its uh, continuity versus its discontinuity. And we really don't have time to get into the Sabbath. I'd love to talk about the Sabbath, but the issues with that get really complicated. I don't believe the Sabbath continues on today. It has nothing to do with my view on tithing. It has to do with my study on the Sabbath. Um, I think that, that tithing and the Sabbath is a decent comparison, but I think there's a better comparison than adultery, murder, circumcision, or Sabbath. And it's going to be a law that is not the most popular uh, dis law discussed in the Old Testament, and it's called the Leveret Law. It's described in Genesis 38, and Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10. Here's what we read in Genesis chapter 38. And it came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite, whose name was Hira. Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he named him Ur. Then she conceived again and bore a son and named him Onan. She bore still another son and named him Shelah. And it was at Chezib that she bore him. Now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground in order not to give offspring to his brother. 
but what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so he took his life also. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I am afraid that he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. Now after a considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. It was told to Tamar, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of Enam, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah had grown up and she had not been given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, for she had covered her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, Here now, let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, what will you give me, that you may come into me? He said, Therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. She said, Moreover, Will you give a pledge until you send it? He said, What pledge shall I give you? And she said, Your seal and your cord, and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her, and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and departed, and removed her veil, and put on her widow's garments. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. He asked the men of her place, saying, Where is the temple prostitute who was by the road at Enium? But they said, There has been no temple prostitute here. So he returned to Judah, and said, I did not find her. And furthermore, the men of the place said, There has been no temple prostitute here. Then Judah said, Let her keep them. Otherwise, we will become a laughing stock. After all, I sent this young goat, but you did not find her. Now it was about three months later that Judah was informed, Your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot, and behold, she is also with child by harlotry. Then Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. It was while she was being brought out that she sent to her father-in-law, saying, I am with child by the man to whom these things belong. And she said, Please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff are these. Judah recognized them and said, She is more righteous than I, inasmuch as I did not give her to my son Shelah. And he did not have relations with her again. So Genesis 38 describes what Deuteronomy 25 is going to clarify for us, and that is the Leveret Law. Here's Deuteronomy 25, 5-10. When brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as a wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. It shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother, so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. But if the man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He is not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of his city shall summon him and speak to him. And if he persists and says, I do not desire to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the sight of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face, and she shall declare, Thus it is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. In Israel, his name shall be called the house of him whose sandal is removed. So just like with tithing, the Leveret Law is mentioned as being practiced before the Mosaic Law. Then we have it incorporated into the Mosaic Law in Deuteronomy 25. Now you can also read through Ruth chapter 4 and you can see the Leveret Law also being demonstrated there. So using a similar logic to that of the tithing advocates, an argument could be made for the continuing validity of the Leveret Law. Now, here is the definition of the Leveret Law. If brothers, brothers live together and one of them dies without an heir, one of the surviving brothers takes his widow to wife, and the firstborn of this new marriage is regarded by law as the son of the deceased. That is the Leveret Law. The purpose of the Leveret Law 
is so that the line of the deceased brother does not end. Now notice in Genesis 38, we don't really have an introduction of the Leveret Law. There's not really any justification or not any reasoning for it. It's not like it's a new law. It was something that was just expected. It was an ex expectation that they had at the time. Now, where did they get this from? Well, just like with tithing, they got it from surrounding societies. Onan understood the repercussions of his father's command, that the children would not be his own, but would be his deceased brother's children. This does not seem to be a strong suggestion, but it appears to be a law that's binding. The fact that they didn't do it caused them to be punished, caused Onan to be punished, and when Judah didn't give his third son, Shelah, to Tamar, and, and, and Judah was found in sin, he says that, that Tamar is more righteous than he because he didn't obey the Leveret Law. Notice Genesis 38.8 talks about fulfilling the duty, fulfilling the duty of the lever. And when Judah was caught, Tamar was called more righteous. She was more righteous because he refused to do what he was supposed to do, and that was provide his son for her. And just like with tithing, the practice of the Leverite law was widespread, and just like with tithing, the origin is unknown. It was practiced by the Assyrians, by the Hindus in India, by some Brazilians, by the Ugarit, by the Moabites, Elamites, Hittites, New Caledonians, Mongols, Afghans, Abyssinians, and some later American Indians. However, rather than tracing back to a command from God, everyone I found traced it back to various sources for various different reasons, usually being societal and cultural. Nobody I found traced it back to the Garden of Eden, and nobody I found said, no, no scholar that I read said that this is eternal or still lasting. Now Deuteronomy 25 is a little bit different than Genesis 38, just like the tithe laws in the Mosaic Law were a little bit different than what we saw in Abraham and Jacob's cases. Some of the modifications in Deuteronomy 25 include, number one, the duty of the lever was limited to a blood brother living close to the deceased brother. Number two, the duty was not binding for the humiliating ceremony of Halizah could release the prospective lever from fulfilling the obligation. So there was a way out of it as long as you didn't mind being humiliated. And number three, the lever would marry the widow. That was never stated before. So that's a clarification in Deuteronomy 25. Now, this was practiced in Judaism, as can be seen in Ruth 4 and in the Mishnah. So, just like with tithing, the Leveret Law was introduced without much justification or reasoning before the Mosaic Law, incorporated into the Mosaic Law with some changes, practiced in Judaism, practiced all the way through the time of the New Testament. Furthermore, the Sadducees asked Jesus a question concerning leveret marriage and the resurrection. We see it in Matthew 22, Mark 12, and Luke chapter 20. All three of these passages are parallel, so we'll just look at Matthew 22, which reads, On that day some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and questioned him, asking, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers with us, and the first married and died, having no children left his wife to his brother, so also the second, and the third, down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had married her. Now this question gave Jesus every opportunity to abrogate or abolish the Leveret Law. He easily could have said something like, well, from now on, we don't do that anymore. He could have abolished it, but he didn't. And he didn't because they were supposed to be practicing the Leveret Law because they were under the Old Covenant. Here's a chart that I put together that talks about whether or not the Leveret Law should continue, whether or not the Tithe Laws should continue, and the comparison between them. The Leveret Law was introduced without justification, and so were the Tithe Laws. The Leveret Law was practiced before the Mosaic Law, as were the Tithe Laws. The Leveret Law was obligatory before the Mosaic Law. Tithe laws weren't. The Leveret Law was widespread and its origin was unknown, as, as the Tithe Laws. 
The Leveret Law codified, was codified with changes in the Mosaic Law, just like the Tithe Laws. It was practiced outside of the Pentateuch in the Old Testament, just like the Tithe Laws. It received a track in the Mishnah. A whole book in the Mishnah was dedicated to the Leveret Law and to Tithe Laws. The New Testament never explicitly abolishes either of them, and Jesus discussed both and never abolished either. Now, I am not saying that the Leveret Law should be practiced today. But the existence of a practice prior to the giving of the Mosaic Law, as well as subsequent to it, does not necessarily prove that it was meant to continue into the New Covenant period. The assertion is inadequate that because tithing existed prior to the giving of the Mosaic Law, it must continue to be practiced by God's people in later periods. That can't be valid because then the Leveret Law would still be valid and we don't practice the Leveret Law today, and we understand the Leveret Law is not for today, that there was an eternal purpose for it that we don't have time to get into, but there was an eternal purpose for it, and it's gone, just like the Tithe Laws. So that concludes our discussion on tithing in the Mosaic Law and in Malachi, and a comparison between the Leveret Law and the Tithe Law. Next time, we're going to discuss every passage that talks about tithing in the New Testament in one passage, that, some would argue, is Paul referencing the concept even though he doesn't explicitly reference tithing.